Pause to the table if you need a rest, you could reminisce here. Good morning, children. Today we have the great privilege of being able to hang out with Ryan West. For those of you who don't know Ryan, he makes records. Who do you mix records for? Well, the last couple of years it's been for uh, Jay-Z, Eminem, producer Just Blaze, Marsha Ambrosius, Rihanna, T.I. Any professionals? No, none at all. These are all nobody, you know, basement dwellers. How do you get to the point where Jay-Z calls you to mix his record? Well, I think the path is um, being involved with and knowing people who are making good music. You know, I started doing independent records just like everybody else did. And, and just through, over the years, I've met some producers who, you know, were working with these big artists and somehow managed to impress them enough to take me on as a, first a recording engineer and then eventually I was able to start mixing. The point is to not stay in your bedroom and work by yourself. No, that's, I think that's a dead-end road. I mean, right now, there are, everybody's got a system in their bedroom, so there's such a sea, there's such a flood of, of new music out there that it would just be a one-in-a-million chance, if not worse odds than that. So networking is the key. Networking is absolutely the key. I still do a ton of it now, as much as I possibly can. Pull up a chair to the table if you need a rest, you can reminisce here. Have you found a big difference working with people at the level of Rihanna and Jay-Z and people like that versus working with some indie guys? Is there different pressure? Is there different attitudes? Yeah, there's certainly a different level of pressure. First off, anytime you're working with a major label record um, act, you have a whole lot of other people to answer to, besides just the artist or the producer, so there's that element. But the other thing is, too, is I think that a lot of the people who get to that level, most of the people that I've had the opportunity to work with are there because they're really professional. They know what to do. It's not always by mistake or chance that somebody becomes a big artist like that, it's usually because they're a combination of talent, a skill, personality, and the people that they surround themselves with. If you go back and listen to something you did six years ago, how does it feel? Total shit. So that means you're always progressing. I'm trying to. You know, I'm a student of this, and I try to get insight from wherever I can. I like to go to puremix.net and watch videos. You know, I think our methods and, and the sound that we go after and that we try to get comes from the sound that's in our head and that's built up over years of listening to music, being a music lover. So we, we build this expectation or this picture of the way we want things to be and it becomes part of our tool set, it becomes part of our musical catalog. And so when we go to work on something, we're drawing from that as inspiration. And I'm always trying to reach out and refill that well because I can't keep relying on the same stuff. Um, Simply because, you know, you can get lost in that process. You can get lost in your quest to get to that place that you used to think was the ideal, you know, skill level or whatnot. And then you do eventually find out after you do enough of this stuff that there is no ideal place. It is a lifelong process. And that's the part of the beauty of it is that you're always cycling through new things and, you know, always trying to improve. Where does the urge to make a certain decision come from? Is it from habit? Is it from, you know, how much do you EQ that bass? Well, I think habit's something that we fight against all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, none of us wants to get deadlocked into one way of working because I, I think that's means to an end. However, you know, there are certain things that you can get into, uh, modes of work that, because you know that they work time and time again, you try to put those in your pocket and use them as a tool that, to make your job a little bit easier and maybe a little bit more predictable. Do you have a system at home or do you mix in studios? How does it work? I do both. I'm um, finding more and more lately that there are a lot of artists who are putting out records who just don't have the kind of budget that would support going to a major studio. There is a qualitative difference. It's a smaller space, it's a smaller system, and it has its limitations, but I still can put out a, a quality mix that they can be proud of, that I can be proud of, and that can stand up next to other stuff that's out there on the radio. So what kind of system is that you have at home? It's a really small Pro Tools system. It's based around um, Apogee interfaces and dangerous D-Box just an eight channel summing rig. Mostly everything gets mixed in the box. Um, I rely pretty heavily on the DDA converter that's in that Apogee box because then I know for sure what I'm hearing. And I know the monitor systems that I have there. I mean, it's kind of modest. It's just a pair of NS10s on a Bryson amp and a pair of Dynaudios with a sub that's switchable. A lot of people think they have to buy a lot of gear to be able to make um, good sounding music. I personally disagree. I completely disagree. I mean, I think there's a certain base level that you have to have in terms of capability. I mean, you have to have, you know, a couple variations of equalizers because they all do different things. And 
Obviously, compression is something you can't have enough choices. But I think the old adage is, is always going to be true. I mean, it's not the gear, it's the year. Right. Is there any plug-in or any piece of gear that's made you happy recently? I've always been a huge fan of the Universal Audio stuff. That's been no secret. I mean, I kind of, you know, I pimp them wherever I can. Because I think they've taken the most and the largest strides in making mixing in the box, or at least mostly in the box, possible. I think they're one of the companies that has pushed the envelope in terms of realism and usability. I think another one of those companies is Sound Toys. And they're two different things. Yep. Sound Toys isn't necessarily trying to recreate, you know, classic gear that we've been using in the studio for years to mix. Universal Audio does that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're mostly about replacing the hardware units that we've been using for such, such a long time. Um, but I see more innovation at Sound Toys. Mm -hmm. They're trying to build processors that are have a lot of flexibility and are built for the real modern world. They make, if it's not my favorite plug-in, it's definitely in my top three, it's the Decapitator. It's not so nice. I mean, the thing is so awesome. It's just like built-in mojo in life. We shot a video with you today. Yeah. Mixing this really great song. Tell us about the song. Yeah, the, the song is called Break Bread. It's from a group called Dugis. They're a New York hip hop group that uh, does live instrumentation as well. They got a great live show. It's three MCs, and one of the MCs is a pretty cool vocalist too. And in this song in particular, they had two guest artists on it um, a vocalist named Nikki, who did um, background vocals and harmonies on the chorus, and then also John Legend did vocals on the chorus as well. And they put out a couple of videos this year. They have a really fun one for a song called Beer. It's a lot of fun. I got to be in the video too. So. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to go see it. Thanks for watching PureMix.net and Ryan West.